We are here today at the East Ridge Rec Center in Highlands Ranch. My name is Mark Stevenson. I do oral histories with the Highlands Ranch Historical Society, and we are pleased to have here today with us a longtime resident of the area, Johnny Beeman. Uh, Johnny's background in the area goes back many years, but today we're going to talk about his remembrances, in particular with the Arapaho Hunt Club. So welcome, Johnny. Again, Thank you. Today, this is March 14th at the East Ridge Rec Center, and he has agreed to do this oral history with us. So, Johnny, tell me a little bit about yourself and your first remembrances, what age you might have been at when you had involvement with the Arapaho Hunt Club. Well, my first remembrances, uh, my dad was in the Navy. I was born in San Diego. Uh, I remember we came here, I think, on our way to Louis moved to Louisiana when I was about five. And that was because your dad was in the Navy? In the Navy. And so he got transferred from San Diego to Louisiana, so me and my brother, James, I remember we came here to the hunt club, uh, and I remember riding on some horses at the, at the, at the, at the barns. Uh, my dad had worked there with his brother George uh, before he joined the Navy, so he had been an employee there and had lived there for several years, so he knew, knew all about it, of course. So I remember that. Uh, we went to Louisiana, we went to Tennessee on our way to the Philippines back in like... Uh, I was about third grade then. We came and spent three months getting our shots at Fitzsimmons to go overseas, so we stayed in Levere's and Sedalia. We went to the hunt club many times, and my dad would help his brother George, and of course, got to know all the people that worked there. Then on when we came back uh, from the Philippines, my dad eventually retired in San Diego. Uh, that had been in about 66. And after he retired, then he decided to eventually move back to Colorado. Well, he got a job with his brother George at the hunt club. We moved back when I was a senior in high school in 1968. And where did you live at that point? We lived in the one of the houses. There was like uh, six houses at the hunt club. We were on the back side of, there was a row of four, a uh, smaller house. And so me and my brother and two sisters and mom and dad, we lived in that. For, I would say a year and then we moved into the big stone house which was right next to Uncle George's house uh, on the lower. Was place. this the house that uh, Lawrence Phipps II built for uh, built for George? No, this that was in a, 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 a well it, that could have been his first house because then they had a newer house right next to it which was more modern. Mm -hmm. I would say that it was probably built in, the, let's say, the late 50s or early 60s. And that's where George was, him and Marguerite were living in that one. Of course, their kids had grown up. So I'm thinking that that stone house was the original house for them to live in. I see. Had a uh, coal furnace in the basement that uh, you had to mess with it, of course, keep it clean, get the clinkers out of it. Uh, at that time, when we moved there, living in the upper house, uh, a cousin of mine, Tom Treehall, lived in the basement of that, and uh, that's when Kay and Bunny Morgan lived there. Bunny was George's daughter. Uh, Kay was Marianne Morgan's son. And so I hung out with my cousin Tom, and we, they'd fire that furnace up at night. It'd be like 120 degrees in the bedroom, so we'd open out the out, walk out. Uh, basement doors so we wouldn't be roasting too bad. Of course, we wake up in the morning and be freezing cold because all that cold air would come down in there. But eventually we moved into that house after uh, Kay and Bunny moved. And uh, so working there uh, as, a, as I was a senior in high school then. What kind, uh, of, what kind of work were you doing? Well, I was one of the, one of the hands that uh, in, in, during like in the winter time when the uh, Hunt horses were there. They had about up to like 30 horses that were stabled and barned in a box and box stalls that we uh, fed, groomed, took care of. Uh, and you had like a, a group of four per person that were your kind of your four to take care of. My understanding is the hunt in the winter hunted 
perhaps two to three times a week, Wednesdays and perhaps Saturday and Sundays. Was that your recollection? Yes, uh, Sundays was the, the main hunt. Uh, people would come from other hunts from around the world, which was always exciting. Uh, they would come uh, either more locally, they bring their own horses, or we, we the FIBS had horses available for them to ride because uh, all those hunts that were connected over the years. Uh, always nice people, uh, interesting to talk to. Uh, so that was a Sunday hunt. The Wednesdays and Saturdays were kind of like training hunts for the younger dogs and also to exercise the dogs in the middle of the week. The uh, Sunday one was formal. The uh, Saturday and, and Wednesday ones were not formal at all, and other people could come and just actually just tag along to exercise their horses with George and the hounds and, and the whips. Uh, my dad was a whip when he when he had lived there earlier, so he became a whip again to help George uh, control the hounds. What was your involvement on those days, Wednesdays, Saturdays, or Sundays? Well, uh, we got only got a half. One day a week off, and that was a half a day. And the days off were Monday available was Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Could you no, pick your time? Uh, well, you could pick what day, and that was your day most of the time, unless um, there was always a, the, the fear of uh, as you got off, and because you got off after breakfast, uh, if you uh, wanted to go do something, usually you left before breakfast and went to town. Otherwise, if you're coming out after eating breakfast and a semi shows up with a load of hay, uh, you get the day off after the load of hay gets unloaded. Understand. So you learn pretty quick, if I wanted to go do something, I, I'll eat breakfast in Castle Rock or somewhere else. Cause yeah. When you say favorite. going to town, I was going to ask you, which towns did you go to and what were you typically doing there? Uh, usually, uh, being a senior in high school, I'd go to Cass Rock and visit with all my high school buddies there. Uh, we'd go to that like B&B cafe on Main Street there, uh, hang out in front of the courthouse, see who's driving around and see who's in town and visiting, because uh, everybody went to Douglas County High School at that time, so even people from Parker, Franktown, um, everywhere else, uh, the Plum Creek area even, they every, all all school kids went to that high school, so it was all, everybody in the whole county went there, so therefore you knew everybody on the outer edges of the county. Uh, we would uh, hang out, go, go check out stuff, go out to Castlewood Canyon, you know, hike. I was an avid hiker, I never was a TV guy, so I'd just out and about how enjoying you, things. How did you get there? Uh, at that time, I had uh, originally I bought a car from my Uncle George. He had a, I think it was a 49 Plymouth in one of the garages. Uh, he quit driving it many years before, and so I told him I'd like to get a car to drive. So I bought that car for one dollar. Uh, we had to pull the gas tank out of it because it was full of rocks because the gas cap was missing. So as all the kids had walked through that garage, they would put sticks and leaves and rocks in that. And I remember when we dumped it out, I was amazed there was like part of a bushel basket of rocks and sticks and twigs that were in that gas tank. Uh, that car, we put gas in it, it ran great. Uh, we used actually used it. Uh, I would drive us kids that went to school, uh, my brothers, sisters, and uh, there was a couple other uh, helpers, families that had children, uh, and I would drive them all out to, out to Highway 85, uh, past the polo field, Park the car, and we wait for our, my high school bus went south, and their elementary school bus went to uh, Plum Creek Elementary. So we drove that car back and forth. It was fun, and it ran great. It also had a spotlight on it, which was fun because we'd drive it out at night, and people would come in and park and drink beer on that polo field, and we'd walk, drive up, and shine the spotlight on them, which would you know freak them out. And then we'd just drive back to the houses, and of course they would leave too. So that was a fun car to have, and we're out like looking for deer or wildlife uh, with that with that spotlight. It made it pretty enjoyable. Did you 
you ever go to towns other than Castle Rock? Sedalia, Denver? Yeah, we, uh, went to Sedalia because I had five uh, aunts and uncles that lived there. So I had lots of cousins. Uh, my dad was the youngest of seven. Him and one sister moved away. The other five stayed in Sedalia. So I had lots of cousins to go visit. Plus, those uh, aunts and uncles had married into other families, as my Uncle George and my, my dad had. So all of their uh, siblings also lived there. So I had even more, I guess, second and third cousins or cousins-in-laws, as we called it. Uh, they weren't actually blood relatives, but they were relatives through marriage, which made them a family. family. Family, family, family yeah. relative, yeah. Good. And everybody knew each other, and you know everybody got along, so you could go to anybody's house and just have, have a good time visiting, uh, eating supper with them, or going and doing something with their kids. You spoke of perhaps other chores that you did when you worked at the uh, Hunt Club property. Yeah, uh, besides uh, taking other care of the horses. The, other than unloading hay. Yeah, other than the horses, uh, we also uh, uh, like maintained the roads. Uh, George had a big drag that he pulled behind a truck, so when it, almost whenever it rained or the snow kind of was drying up, we would hop in that you know, pickup truck and drag drag the roads while the roads were kind of a little wet to get rid of all the uh, chuck holes and washboarded areas. Uh, Which roads are you speaking of? What's that? Which roads are you speaking of? Mainly that, that road was the one from the club, Hunt Club, out to Highway 85. Now the, and that's pretty short. That's about a mile. Yeah. Give or take. Uh, and so we just kept that one because that's where most of the traffic came and went out of that road. That we also had a road that went all the way back to headquarters up through the property and he would get out uh, they had a I think it was an Alice road grader uh, and he would go get that at the headquarters and I remember riding with him it'd take two or three days to grade all of them roads from headquarters down to the hunt club but this that is way the one they, that goes through what's now the back country is it not? yes yeah, or through or by the the failing ranch property. Yeah, or it, it, the it Douglas, came through that back or the Douglas Douglas Investment Pasture. Well, that Lewis the Douglas Investment was farther south. Yeah, I've been on one of those roads before, but this is the one further north. Yeah, this one uh, it kind of it went well up from the back of the Hunt Club all the way to to the to the ranch. It came up came out at at the uh, windmill. Okay, and. Uh, we used to go to that windmill uh, because there was uh, mower parts for when we were mowing the, the uh, polo field. <coughs> the Ford tractor and it had a, a rotary drum mower uh, and so we would go to that uh, windmill building to get the mower blades and stuff and of course there was always you never went there without a stick because there was a good chance there might be one or two rattlesnakes in there. Uh, I never saw any myself, but my Uncle George and everybody else had seen them, so whoever went in first went in with a stick and poked around the boxes before we actually, every, the other person would come in and actually help get the parts that we might need and take them back out. Yeah, as docents of the Highlands Ranch Mansion, we always wondered what was kept in that building next to the stone windmill. Yeah, that's. Uh, I know they had the mower parts for that, and there was, seems like there was some uh, belts and stuff which might have went to the windmill for the pump on it. Um, I know we had a pump at uh, at the hunt club, uh, so we, and it fed a cistern up, up behind the barns, so I know it had extra belts there for that, because I know Did we had ever have to do any windmill maintenance yourself? I remember climbing up on that windmill with Uncle George uh, guiding me from the ground. Uh, we went up there, I think I put some oil in like the transmission on, on the windmill itself, which um, for a young guy in high school it was pretty exciting. Sure. Uh, I wasn't afraid of heights and I was, a, I was an avid climber so I enjoyed getting up there and of course the view was, I would call it fantastic because that was the highest point on about everywhere to the other side of Denver. Uh, so whenever we did go up there and check that out, um, it was it was always exciting. Yeah. yeah, Lawrence Phipps III told the story is that when he had to be involved in windmill 
maintenance of that mm -hmm. stone place, he always took a handgun with him. Yeah. And yeah. particularly in the summertime when they opened the door and it was cool inside, oh, inevitably yeah. he would hear the hiss of a rattler and would have to take care of that before somebody could go up inside and get yeah. on the platform and do whatever maintenance was, was required. Yeah, I, I got that rule, you know, laid to me the first time we went and every time after, always, you know, open the door, look cautiously, have a stick to uh, poke around because uh, there might, there could be one in there because there, there yeah. had been. When you went to the mansion, other than getting parts for the mowers, the graders, and things, what else did you do, or what else were you involved in when you went to the mansion property itself? Well, uh, for many times we went there, we would haul hay or straw out of the uh, Plum Creek Ranch site over where Chatfield Dam is now. Uh, that was a, was a working ranch over there. We would haul the hay and straw. Uh, we drive over there, load up the racks on a, an old international truck. I think it was a two-ton that, that young Lori, he enjoyed the inter internationals, so that's the trucks that we had to work with. Uh, put the racks on, we'd go haul hay, we'd haul straw. We'd take it, some of it to the hunt club. Uh, some of it would go to the, to the, to the headquarters, which was always exciting because uh, that all went into those big milking barns. And those barns at the time had, we had hay and straw, at some at the ends of them, but most of them, uh, one of them I know particularly was full of old vehicles. Now there were old cars, I, I'm pretty sure they were from the 30s or maybe 40s. There were old uh, wagons and fancy buggies. Uh, there was also, the coolest thing was kind of like a little, it was a snow cat. It was like a snowmobile, but it was a Caterpillar engine with tracks, and it had three or four sleds that they would use it in the winter time for haul and feed there at the, at, at the, at the headquarters. And I always thought that was the, the coolest piece of equipment in there because it was pretty big, but it had these sleds that would hook together for putting your feet on for going out through the fields and checking that stuff out, you know, feeding animals. Uh, we also would go check out the bowling alley that was there because it was still operational at that time. Um, they didn't use it very much but we could go in and check it out. Again, what year are we talking about now? This would have been like around 68 or 69 and 70. So this I was still owned by Mr. Phipps. Yes. He was still alive. Still live there. Yeah. Uh, we would stop in and say Bob Morgan was still one of the foremen. Mm -hmm. Marion and they lived, I assume, in one of the cottages. Yeah, they lived in the, the smaller of the two, and because Marvin was living in the bigger of those two houses. He yeah. was there for a while, I'm not sure how long, but of course we'd go visit with him. And this My understanding is that Marvin moved there after the flood of 1965. Yeah. Because his property was damaged down by Plum Creek, yep. and they, he and Uni had to go someplace. Yeah, so they, they were there, and so it was, they were there for a while. It was Marion was there much longer. Yeah, and uh, she eventually moved into the bigger house, I believe, yep. and uh, right up until she passed away. Mm -hmm. I used to stop in and see her whenever I did my mountain man program for Highland Ranch days. I'd always stop and visit with her because we were kind of related, and of course she'd known me since I was a young guy too, so it was always enjoyable talking with her. When you spoke of uh, the Plum Creek Ranch, which now is Chatfield, this must all have been prior to 65. This, this yeah. when <clears throat> the flood happened, and after that, the federal government condemned and took the, the land by yeah. domain. And <clears throat> some of those schools and hay meadows were uh, underneath water now. Yeah, they, they were Chatfield Reservoir. Yeah, they were purchased by the government too. But we could still, uh, he could still uh, produce and harvest off of them until they became unusable. So we, uh, like I say, hauled the haul, stray and uh, straw and hay, and uh, it was always kind of exciting going over there because uh, we knew it was usually, of course, the middle of the summer when we were doing that. Uh, we could stop on the top of the uh, Highline Canal and take our clothes off and jump in and take a quick swim to cool off and then hop back out, get in the truck and drive back and unload that load and maybe come back and get another one. Uh, that's when there was still water in the Highland Canal. In the Highland Canal, Canal yeah. Because I know even that in, was... Even in the summertime, huh? Yeah, yeah. And um, they, they would dry up and they'd dry it in the winter, but it, all summer long it, it flowed water. Cool. And it was, of course, good water from 
up by that scrunch or spring area where it fed mm -hmm. into it. Uh, an interesting thing, there was a town called Riverside Acres down past Plum Creek, uh, the ranch. And uh, those houses, when that land was condemned and bought, the government bought the land, but they didn't buy the houses. And so uh, we would go down there and haul hay, and then we, we'd go get a load on, and we might drive through that, that little village. And there were houses sitting there with the doors and windows open, and we, would, we walked in there, and there would still be furniture, pictures, mirrors, uh, like they just left in the night, because everybody just took what they could and left the house. Now, I know some of those houses were um, bought and then moved out, uh, over by Chatfield Dam, there by Roxborough and Titan Road, there was a couple of subdivisions that were built at that time. <coughs> and some of those houses were actually moved over there. And I knew a bunch of the families that had built new houses over there that originally had houses down in <coughs> at Riverside Acres. Okay, we're back with Johnny Beeman talking about memories of the Arapaho Hunt Club facility off of Santa Fe. He also, uh, you also had um, dealings with uh, the Highlands Ranch Mansion property itself. Were you ever in the what we call the mansion today? And if so, what was your relation with Mr. Phipps, the owner? Uh, I went over. We went over there quite a few times and. Uh, the times while my cousin Marvin lived in one of the houses, of course, we'd come and visit him, and uh, we might stop over to say hi, say hi to Mr. Phipps. Uh, there were several times they had some gatherings there, and we went over, and uh, of course, Mr. Phipps being like one of the nicest guys I've ever met, he would, uh, one time I know somebody needed some iced tea, and he, he just went and got some for them. That's, that was the kind of guy he was. Um, I tell people he might have been the maybe the most wealthiest, might have been the wealthiest person in the Denver at that time, uh, which I didn't know, but he sure didn't act that way. He was just down to earth, nicest, nice fellow. <clears throat> we would hang out there. I remember playing frisbee, uh, football on that on that front front field there, uh, riding bicycles up and down around the barns, uh, hanging out, you know. There and if Mr. Phipps was out, out, out and about, he, you know, you'd go, you could go over and talk to him. One of the stories that uh, one of Mr. Phipps's uh, grandchildren, Susanna Ray, uh, told me is that there were a couple big events that they would hold at HQ. One was, if the weather permitted it, was to drive fireworks over the lawn there on the north side of the mansion. And the other was Thanksgiving for an all hands uh, in the dining room and kitchen area uh, associated with the, uh, the ranch itself. Not actually in the mansion building, but mm -hmm. in the, uh, the bunkhouse area. Were you involved in either of those? I was never at any of those, but we hung out at the bunkhouse with, uh, with, the, with the cowboys that lived there. Uh, one, one, I knew a friend in about third grade when we were here, um, Willie Reed, his brother was one of the ranch hands at, at, at headquarters. And his, his, uh, he lived out at the hunt club. And so we go there and of course visit and those are just regular good old guys, cowboys. Of course they knew my uncle and they knew my dad. And uh, you're just like one of the family. And they of course be joking about what they're gonna be going. I always ask, what are you guys doing? And they're like, well, we're trying to do nothing right now, but there's the list of stuff we're going to try to get done this today, uh, which there was always lots of things to do. What's your understanding of how many cowboys at any time of the year or during spring branding season or whatever actually worked at, the, at headquarters? It there? seems to me there was always at, at least six or let's maybe six or eight that was there all the time when I was there for those you know, the three years that I actually worked there because you could go see them and talk to them and you might see them in Castle Rock, of course, uh, on, at night when they're, on, when they're out on a town also. But I, I think about that many. And then they would have others would show up to help for the branding and stuff because they had quite a few cows there. Good. 
I never knew how many cows they had. I always joke with people that, well, I know at one time there was 2,000 cows and, uh, and like 15 people on, on the ranch. Mm -hmm. And I said, now, now that's kind of changed. There's, you know, 15 cows and uh, 2,000 people. Where did they keep the cows? Uh, well, most of those were, uh, I think, on pastures t to the east side, up towards the Daniels Park side. I remember we, uh, as one of our chores at the hunt club, was to keep the fences fixed up on Daniels Park Road because the people would yeah. drive off the road and drive through the fence. I always joked with my Uncle George and my dad and the other hands. I said, what we need to do is uh, don't fix the fence here. Let's put a fence at like 20 feet back into the scrub oak that they ain't going to run into. Right. And that way that keeps the cows in and the people could still run into the fence like they wanted to, but it wouldn't do any damage because it was the outside <laughs> fence that just was there for show. But George never, he didn't think that would be funny you know. But I always thought, you know, have two fences and one to fix and one to just let them tear up. Do you remember the cattle being kept on the pastures of what's now under Chatfield? No, I just was in on the hay. You said you were in on the hay. That was, so toward that, was, that was at the end of um, Plum Creek's life yeah. as usable property. That was what about the East Ranch? Um... I went to the Cheese Ranch a couple times. So we can't remember. We just drove by there. I don't, whenever I rode with Uncle George, which I did a lot, him and him or my and my dad, which was always kind of fun because here's two people that look almost alike on either side of you. And of course, they sounded the same. They talked the same. They had the same memories. So one would start talking about a memory, and they would just feed on each other. And of course, I just took all that in as, as much as I could. They told me a story about the Cheese Ranch several, many times. Uh, Stu Morelli, whose uh, sister married Uncle George, uh, Marguerite, uh, when Stu got married, he was, I guess, living at the Cheese Ranch. So uh, after, the, after the wedding ceremony, everybody left and they went, went home. But my dad and George and everybody else came back for a chivalry. So they said they pulled up with the headlights oh, yeah. on. Yeah, they uh, they mentioned that in the movie Oklahoma. Oh, do they? They oh. do. And so they after uh, Curly and Lori get married, they have that. And they on uh, top of a haystack. They said it was a wild. Um, people, of course, everybody had kept drinking after the wedding party, so they were all primed for a, a wild party. They went to the house. They ran around outside and in the house with pots and pans, banging and hooping and hollering, and got. Got the married couple up and out of bed. Uh, they had, a, of course, they started cooking and drinking and eating, and they brought a, a, a goat in and milked it on the kitchen table. Uh, <laughs> I, I, they had a, a good time. That was good. You had another interesting story about that cheese ranch. My wife was born and raised up in Denver, uh, 20th and Kipling, and on her street where her mom and dad had built a house in 1950, another lady and her husband had built one the same year when that, when that dairy farm was getting turned into housing. And her name was Dap, and um, she was born, I think, in like, let's say, 1905. So she was older than a lot of people that I knew. <coughs> And I was telling her about, you know, growing up, living at the hunt club and working down there. And she's like, oh, well, that's pretty interesting. She asked me if I'd ever been to the cheese ranch. And I said, well, we, I've been by it a couple of times, but it wasn't in use when I was there. And uh, it was starting to, you know, fall apart. She says, well, an interesting story. She dug in her pictures and brought out a picture of her and her cousin who lived at the cheese ranch. Her parents, her cousin's parents worked there. They lived in the big house? They, I'm not sure which one. But they lived there, and she would come and spend part of the summer there uh, when she was in her early teens. So that would have been in the, back in the 30s and you know, 20s or 30s back in then. And she always thought how exciting it was, because once they went there, they were it was out in the middle of nowhere, literally. Uh, she said they just felt like they were the only people in the world. You know. 
she said, oh, she, that was her memory of living there uh -huh. at the cheese ranch, and they produced, you know, cheese products and stuff like that. We did, inter we did interviews with the Cole family. Did you know any of them? Uh, there my was understanding is at one point when they went to work for Mr. Phipps, the housing that was available to them was at the cheese ranch. So they lived in that house for a while as yeah. well. And this was um, in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to school with a girl, Debbie Cole, and I think her dad was still working there. I'm pretty sure he was. Uh, I think um, he was in charge of all the <clears throat> pond building and grading operations. Groundwork. Yeah. <clears throat> he, I mean, uh, so I, I know I, I dated her. We went out a couple times uh, just, just to go to Castle Rock. And I know he, uh, I remember seeing him several times. I'd stop on Highway 85. He'd be driving a bulldozer with a, uh, I think he had a big disc that he went a long, hot, whole length of 85 of Phipps's property to, to uh, disc up so there was a no, no chance in case somebody started a fire along the highway, it couldn't get in, into the onto the into the fields. Yeah. I know that was I always saw him either on a bulldozer or on a tractor. I, um, yeah, and, I understand he liked his equipment quite a bit. That's you know that, I remember I remember I helped haul some diesel fuel out there once for him and uh, he let me ride on the bulldozer with him for a while, you know, and of course he just he was in heaven driving a bulldozer and discing discing land, you know, which at that time in my life, it wasn't quite as exciting as it would be now for me. Sure, but I did I did tough it out and ride with him. Of course, it was really dusty; you could hardly breathe. And like he said, it's just a beautiful day out here, you know. Which I've carried that on since then. It's good. Switching topics on you a little bit. Sure. Uh, tell me about what type of work you did with the hounds at the hunt club. Well, we uh, talked a little bit about the horses and yeah. the hay meadows, but. We haven't talked too much about the hounds. It was uh, during the winter time when the hunt was going on, you had your horses to take care of in, in your barn. That was your main chore. Um, but during the summer time, we had polo. Well, polo, you didn't. You only had a couple, six horses in instead of 30 horses in. So they weren't as much work uh, as the, the hunt horses. So I could go help the, uh, the houndsmen. Uh, Ted Weegert was his name, and uh, they had around, usually around 90, 90 dogs. Uh, of course, in the spring, they'd have two or three females that would have pups, so they had a whelping shed with yards around it, so you could go help take care of them pups, check on them, feed them, water them. Uh, water and take care of the horse, or the, of those hounds. They had a big uh, cauldron. Uh, I remember when I was little, it had a coal fire under it. When I came there, and when I was in high school, it had a propane fire underneath it. But Ted would fill that up with water. He would uh, cut up chunks of meat. Now we would have horse meat, deer meat, and some cow meat that they would cube up, put in there, and, and cook it. Then once the meat was done, then they would add oatmeal to it and cook that oatmeal, and uh, this was before we would go eat breakfast in the morning. So once that was, the oatmeal was cooked, he'd turn the fire off, and um, we would uh, go eat breakfast, then we'd come back, and once that had sat, then he would, we would take that, and they had troughs about a foot square, 10, 12 foot long, metal troughs. Uh, you would bucket that oatmeal and meat out, spread it into that trough, then they would take dried dog food and you would spread that on top of it and kind of just lightly mix it in so that mm -hmm. dog food would have a little bit of moisture from the oatmeal and the horse meat, don't know, cow you know, meat. And um, then you would let in a group of hounds like maybe 15 or 20 at a time and you stood back because those hounds were there to eat, and that, that was all they did. Uh, it'd take only two or three minutes. The trough would be empty. The dogs were lip, licking up any piece that might have landed on the ground next to it, and then you'd say out, and they would all leave out their door. Then you would fill it up again, do another group of 20 or so, and uh, you'd get those fed. 
I understand these dogs were paired in some of the time. What was your experience with that? Well, sometimes they were paired to, uh, there was a couple things that I knew of. Uh, if they were like a, a younger one trying to show him how, how they operated in, in the group. So you'd have an older senior dog that you'd put it on a collar with about a six inch chain. So they could run right next to each other, but there was no getting away from each other. You were right next to each other. <clears throat> I know that was one reason for that. Also, if uh, I remember several times when dogs would get into a fight. And um, so that would uh, be bad because both of those dogs would be put in collars that were connected. And until you could get along, you were together. And usually they learn pretty quick. If we don't fight, then they might take this collar off of us. Otherwise, we're buddies forever. And that's day in and day out. They never took it off until they settled down. How often were the dogs exercised on well, non-hunting hunting days? Uh, well, th three days a week for sure, year-round. You know, hunt day was Sunday. The uh, Wednesday and Saturday were like either you use the cubs, the younger pups, or just to take a group out to exercise. So it was always three days a week those dogs went out because we we even exercise them sometimes in you know in the summer on other than those Wednesday and Saturdays. Sometimes we take them out like on a Sunday afternoon thing just just to exercise. And who took the dogs out? Uh, George always took them out. He he was the master of the hunt. They they. Uh, they all loved him. And um, Marvin later on? Then Marvin after after I was went to college and, and stuff and uh, that's when George kind of was not retired but not riding as, as easy as he used to after being bucked off many times yep. as my dad was too. Um, <coughs> we uh, take him out and uh, it was always interesting on those practice times uh, we'd just be out exercising, and, and some people would come bring their horses and ride with us just, just to ride on a non-official hunt. <clears throat> and there, several times, uh, my dad or one of my cousins or whoever was whipping would talk about we'd be riding, and all of a sudden, uh, we would, uh, they would point out, there's a coyote over on a hillside. And I'd be like, oh, that's cool. And he says, well, if you just watch. We'd be chasing a, a, a coyote, and that coyote would kind of slowly veer over by that hillside. And as the closer we got, that coyote would disappear. Well, by the time we got to there, all of a sudden the dogs would turn and go the other way. And I always wondered, boy, the, those coyotes, coyotes are so smart that like to change directions. Well, my dad explained to me, well, the one coyote who was leading them, he would keep going, but this other one would cross that trail and take the dogs off of him so he could rest, and then he would lead them for a while. Interesting. And then during the day, uh, any time during the day or night, you would go out at the hunt club there, and there'd be a coyote, one or two sitting up on a hillside, yipping back and forth just to uh, stimulate the dogs, as we called it. And of course, all the dogs would see him and want to go get him. And they were, you know, in their their cage. And uh, my dad says, "Yeah, them them dog, them coyotes are pretty smart. They they knew they weren't going to get chased, so they could get pretty close, and they could yip and walk back and forth on that hillside, knowing that they're okay." This is the hillside north of the. This, no, this is to the south, across to the, the south. gulch, because they okay. could see over there. And uh, and I always always told my dad, "Well, God, you know, they keep killing them." killing them coyotes, and of course, they, they rarely killed coyotes, maybe, you know, I remember maybe one a year, if that, because those coyotes were smart enough, after a while, they were done letting those dogs chase me, I'm, I'm going home, and they would double back or do something, and the dogs would all of a sudden be no scent. Okay, Johnny, we've been talking about your working with the hounds in terms of feeding them, exercising them on occasion at this point. What else would you like to talk about about the hounds? Well, I also got to help sometimes with some of the vet, vet, vet work, as you would call it. Uh, they would get like uh, puncture rooms from fighting. Mm -hmm. They'd also get puncture rooms from just running through like the scrub oak like they do. 
And what uh, would you do? Well, on those you'd uh, they hold that dog down, put him in like a little squeeze pin thing, and then you could uh, either cut open the abscess and to drain it, or put, put some uh, ointment up in it. Occasionally, you'd get some uh, mites or uh, like an infection in their ear, so you'd uh, wipe wipe those out and flush them out, and put some type of a sulfur product down in there to dry it and clean it. Uh, we also, I got the help with uh, vetting the horses. Um, some of that would have been like floating the teeth, uh, shots, uh, same thing, uh, puncture wounds. Uh, then also the horseshoer would come and they, we might keep two or three horses in to be shooed at one time. Because you do that pretty regularly. Uh, and uh, just be there to help whoever was doing whatever. I was there to help do it, Good. which made it kind of exciting because you weren't doing the same exact thing every day. It was pretty much a lot of the same, but there was always one or two wild cards in there that you never knew what, you know, George would let us know in the morning that so-and-so is coming over, whether it be a horseshoe or a, one of the vets, to uh, bet on a horse. And um, then they also clippered them, trimmed the hairs on them for in the winter time. And also the polo ponies in the summer, you would clip the hairs to uh, so they could, when they sweat, you could wash them off easier. Trim the manes and the tails, uh, work on them that way. Good. You mentioned there were other outbuildings at the Hunt Club facility there. Yeah, besides the big barns and the, and the, the kennels part for the for the hounds, uh, there was a big hay shed out out in the out in the creek sand gulch there where we hauled the straw and kept the big trucks parked. We'd go out there and hang out like if it was going to start raining we'd run down there and get out out into that and uh, just climb up on the hay and or straw and listen to the rain coming down on the roof and then it'd cool off and be you know nice and enjoyable. I camped out there a bunch of times because I was an out, I'm an outdoor like kind of guy and it was always so nice out there and quiet and other other sheds they had. There was like a pump house that had our well pump. Um, a little cistern was up behind the barns on the hillside, so you kept a check on that float. And if it was starting to get to the lower side, you would George would say, "Well, we're going to pump some water today." So we would go in there, fire the pump up, and then check it every hour or two to make sure it was still pumping okay, and then make sure you didn't overfill the cistern. If you did that, that water ran all the way downhill past all the houses, so everybody knew that you'd uh, overfilled it. So it wouldn't you, be a good thing. You couldn't yeah. get, get away with it, or they, and everybody would kid you for days on end about it. Yeah, the law enforcement center didn't go in until 86, 87. The buildings you're speaking of, are they still with there being um, repurposed by I, the law enforcement people? Boy, I, I don't know. I, I want to go up there. I know the, one of the big barn, and part of it had burned mm -hmm. before they took over. Um, so I don't know if that's still there. I, I need to talk to a couple of my buddies that, that uh, work there and go out and do a reconnoiter and see what's there. Because there was like uh, four houses and a trailer house on the, on the north side of the road that went to the headquarters and the two houses at George and that we lived in uh, on the lower side. Mm -hmm. They also had the, we had some uh, brood mares there that they would breed every year and uh, so we had some brood mare ox stalls for raising the little ones. Um, we would have those uh, those brood mares there right up until they had their, had their uh, colds. Then once they had a colt, we would every day, twice a day, we would go there and of course feed that mother horse. But also we would work and mess with those young young colts, because George, uh, being quite the horseman he was, this was before uh, I guess horse whisper I think was a term. He could walk up to any horse, and they would be the nicest horse there. You know, even those that might want to bite me. Or try to kick me, George could walk up and just start talking to him in his nice, quiet voice, and those horses would just walk up to him. So I think how he developed that was 
these baby colts, from day one, we would talk to them, we would hold them, we would hold them by the head and uh, talk to them and rub them and mess with their ears and their mane and their tail and pick up their legs. And of course, after a short time, they got used to you handling them. So if you needed to check them out for something, there was no problem. Uh, they were just, they would be mellow to you, our being there, they weren't afraid. And when in the life of a, <clears throat> of a new colt does a saddle get put on? Well, we, or were, a, or we, bridle, would, or? we would start, uh, put, a, put a, a, a rope around their neck, just let it hang, so they could get used to something on them. Um, after a while, we'd put a gunny sack on their back with nothing in it. And just have that gunny sack on her while you're feeding the mom and you know grooming her a little bit and cleaning up uh, manure in, in that box stall. And then eventually we they have a halter put on them and they would get like I say get used to it. Then uh, after uh, usually I think a year and a half, two years they would start riding them. And, but and in that meantime you kept putting more and more on them. So when you put a saddle on them, they weren't they weren't freaked out. They might be a little spooky because it was a little heavier than what the, you had been putting on them, but they, they were okay with something on their back. So it wasn't bronco busting. Correct. Because right. my, my, George didn't, didn't like that type of horse breaking. Yep. And when they did ride them, they would ride them in the sand gulch, so it was just pure sand. So they had good traction, so less chance of slipping and falling. And where was this? That was uh, right below the houses. Uh, to the south of the houses, and that gulch went mm -hmm. east towards Daniels Park. And that's where that drainage came down right. through there, and that, that came all the way out to 85. So that, that sand gulch was where they would work them young horses, or if somebody brought a, a young horse to, to break, that's where we load up. Uh, you'd have one or two people riding on the green horses, but you'd have two or three or four other guys on an old uh, established horse that you could walk along beside so the young one when they're kind of freaking out the old ones just like well just keep walking and we'll be okay and you could kind of walk with them and that way there's no chance of them jumping around and hurting themselves or you if you're on the back of it and that way they just learned that we're just walking up this sand gulch we're going to turn around and come back and then that was it for the day so that made it you know like I say George was uh, a mellow type of trainer, I guess I would call right. that. He, and I, I worked with other other people since then, and uh, that that system works pretty good. I've had other people that were more of a throw the hands in the air and scream and holler, and that doesn't do anything to make things good. What's your horse experience? When you were first on a horse, how much riding have you done? Ever play polo? Well, I, I we, we messed a little bit. Um, of course, I got to ride uh, mainly exercising horses. <coughs> and, 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 and to, unless it's Sunday, uh, we exercise a lot of those hunt horses. You would take, you would ride one. You'd have one on each side. You might have two on each side, and we take them out and go out that sand gulch. But then we'd go up on a higher uh, plateau there that was a huge open field, and you could get up there, there'd be two or three of us uh, riding horses and, and dragging some other horses to exercise with us. And we just make a big, huge circle out there. Uh, one time, there was a horse, uh, somebody had donated a horse from the Centennial Racetrack, a young horse that wasn't going to be a, a good ride, a good racer, and uh, they donated it there, so Marvin was checking it out, doing some vet work on it. And uh, one day they saddled that horse up for me to ride with a couple of polo ponies uh, in the summertime with some polo ponies. And so we went up onto that big open field. Well, this race horse had a, he had a reach, a third bigger than all the other horses. And then, so we're going along, loping along, doing good. And all of a sudden he put it into overdrive, which meant he stretched out a little farther. Well, all of a sudden, he's going faster than the two horses I'm trying to lead are. And so I got a choice, either let them pull me off backwards or try to hang on to this guy, because he's, of course, he's headed straight for the scrub oak area. So I, I let go of the, the two lead ponies and 
managed to get him to turn, and he turned and he ran around that whole that whole pasture while everybody else was kind of following along, just like out of you know I had no control over him. He, his his racing instinct kicked in, and all I was there, I was there thrown. to hang on. You didn't get thrown though. No, no, he, he, he was just just running fast, and of course I had you know, Yahoo. I was hanging on, you know. Yeah. So then eventually he kind of started running out of steam, and then I can't remember who, but somebody had let go of their horses and uh, caught up to me, and actually got up next to him, and then got him slowed down because he. He wasn't controlling with the reins at all. Yep. It was kind of like riding a motorcycle with no control. You know, yeah, Marvin was a vet there at Centennial. Mm -hmm. A called in vet or yeah, uh, the race almost a house vet. I think they might have called that. And uh, the racetrack got flooded in the '65. It got all it got it? completely wiped out. Uh, yeah, like Eventually, that got turned into housing at some point, but mm -hmm. that must and have that, been much there, later on. There was a there's a, there's a, a building there that was built as a like a an old, old folks home, I guess you could call it. There, it's still you know it's there, and um, I think uh, I know I several several aunts and uncles went into that into that like uh, a, like a retirement home there. Yeah, um, and I of course I went we went over there to Centennial several times to for George to talk to other horse people. Um, uh, and um, it was it was always interesting to go because it was somebody that he'd known his whole life, and of course they uh, had, had a good always a good time to go go there and learn something about horses. Well, speaking of Littleton, other places you went, other trips to Littleton? Would well, you well several. You know, we uh, we went to several places. Uh, Limpke Meat Market was one where we got uh, like during the hunts uh, uh, deer and elk season. We would get scrap meat that, as they process people's mm -hmm. deer and elk, they would save that scrap cut meat for the dogs for the dogs to yep. eat. And they'd put it in 55 gallon barrels and they'd have it in their cooler. And we would show up with the pickup and we'd roll one or two or three 55 gallon barrels of chunks of deer or elk or cow meat into the truck, and we'd roll out a couple empties for them to have to keep filling. Uh, another place we went to was uh, the Littleton Feed store there. Uh, Gary Sutton had that. His parents had it, I think, before him. Uh, right on the corner of Main Street and Littleton there. And then right around the corner of that was a tack shop where we would take all of our harnesses and saddles to be worked on and drop them off so you could do two or three things in one trip to town. So, which made it always exciting, like, where are we going, you know, I don't care, I'm like the dog, just shake the keys, I'm ready to go. And so we would go, and of course, like say, all those people that, and some of them, uh, I knew Gary Sutton until he passed away just a year and a half, two years ago. So it was always, like say, good good times. You still have family in Sedalia? Yeah, I still own the whole, uh, I bought a block of land that my grandmother, uh, Hattie Beeman had, George's mom, um, I always told her when I, as a kid from junior high on, I said, I want to live in your house when I get old. So I was able to buy her property there. My she dad, don't live there now. No. My so dad, I guess you're not old enough. No, no. Yeah. Correct. And my dad bought that from his mom. And uh, uh, about those houses that were in Chatfield, he had, he bought two of those houses and had them moved on to that property. Which we still have. I still have, I own and one the of my one in Sedalia. In Sedalia, there one of my sons still lives there at this time, and yeah. they've been rentals. Uh, he bought them in 1972, and uh, had them moved out and put in there. And the house that the grandma Beeman lived in, when George retired, he had kind of forgot about. He might have to get a place to live. Well, my dad gave him that house for him and. Marjorie to move into, so it was still in the Beeman family there. Yeah, and uh, well, Marvin's got a house in Littleton. Mm -hmm. you know, he and Yuni still live yeah. there, not not civilian. And my cousin uh, George Heyer, who my, that was my dad's twin sister's son, um, Louise married Archie Heyer of Heyer and Price Well Drilling, and so George bought that, and now. 
one of his uh, children live in it, or actually grand, grandchildren live in it. And she's a teacher at Sedalia Elementary. So it's kind of kind of fun, you know, somebody you know that lives there and they're actually related to you there. And so well, I still have that property. It's, it's fun to uh, have, a, have a family name that's still in the area after 150 years yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. But Beeman's have been around the Sedalia area. Yeah. And plus, uh, my my George's oldest brother, Art, uh, when he was 15, that's when their their father passed away from, I guess, like a, a pneumonia thing. He'd gotten a tick bite years earlier, and of course now we know that that Lyme disease is hard on your body, and that's that's what caused he was susceptible to any kind of uh, breathing ailment that came around. He would get it. And that's what uh, they think what he passed from. Well, when he passed away, the mom had seven children. Uh, my dad was five, and my his oldest brother Art was fifteen. Well, the county gave him the job, Graydon Roads, so the family would still have a paycheck. And uh, Uncle Art ran road graders, I think, until he was about seventy-five. Um, Worked for the state, worked for the county, and then he worked for a private contractor. When I started driving diesel trucks uh, in the mid '70s, Art was still run, doing greater work for the guy that I hauled roads for. Yeah. So I could still see Uncle Art all the time, and he showed me how to actually spread gravel in the dope truck on my first load, which was kind of cool, you know, to have that have that relative and be that close to him. Well, what other stories do you want to tell us about today? I'd say uh, another thing uh, that you know, besides the, the hunt club and Phipps's land, see that that south area there, which they called the uh, Douglas Investment. Um, that's we where called it the Douglas Pasture. Or are we talking about the same area? Same thing. Same thing. That was just that the one that butts up against Cherokee Ranch. Mm -hmm. property. The Cherokee Ranch mm -hmm. up towards Daniel's Park. Yeah. Um, I was that was we would go riding in there occasionally. I would go out the back of there on my day off. I like to just go out and look. You know, I'm a trapper mountain man, so I was looking for tracks and animals, uh, and either ride a horse, uh, walk, or a, a, we had a dirt bike, my brother and I, so we could go out and ride. So I went out in that area just to check it out because we never went there very much on horses. Uh, and I remember seeing. Um, I've got some chunks of petrified wood that we can show, and I remember at the mansion there was petrified wood in the rock, rock work in the building. Yeah. And I always, you know, and I asked, you know, one time you know, Uncle George, I said, "Where they, they go into town and you know get this stuff?" He said, "All these stones are off the ranch."